there are three significant matters which I intend to talk about tonight. Each one is reflective of whether this great nation, due to your contributions, efforts and decisions, will still be recognized 50 years from now as the world's greatest nation. First, a bit of history. At the turn of the 20th century, after the end of a brutal and surprisingly difficult victory in the Second British Boer War, Great Britain began to contemplate the great possibility that it would perhaps be not the greatest nature in the nation in the future, and in fact was in decline. For they were seeing that the London Financial District did not get the same type of resources. And they also was recognizing another nation to the West who was larger, had great commitment, had a wonderful constitution, and it would certainly challenge the British. The British, always being smart as hell, didn't try to fight us. <laughs> there are over 305, 404, 140 million Americans in this country today. Its national income, as measured by household earning, is over $50,000 per year, which is compared to the worldwide average of $700 per year. The average income for the developed nations is about $35,000 per year. And the fact is that you have to recognize today other nations are gaining. After all, nations like China, Russia, perhaps India, and perhaps Brazil are growing very rapidly, in fact. And it's very interesting that Japan, though a small nation, has the second largest net income of any country in the world these days. We are living in what I'd like to call the third great power shift in this nation. It could be called the rise, it should be called the rise of the West. Over the past few decades, countries all over the world have been experienced, and this was written two weeks ago, have been experiencing great economic growth that was once very unthinkable. While they have been booms and busts, the overall trend has been tremendously upward. The growth has been most visible in Asia, but it is no longer confined to Asia. That is why to call the shift the rise of Asia does not describe it accurately. In 2006 and 2007, 124 countries grew at the rate of over 4% per year. This includes more than 30 countries in Africa. Two-thirds two of such continent. A person who is described as the fund manager for the uh, part of that world indicates that there are 25 companies more likely to be the world's next great multinational. His list includes four companies, each from Brazil, Mexico, South Korea, Taiwan, three from India, two from China, and one each from Argentina, Chile, Malaysia, and South Africa. Please look around you. The tallest building in the world today is in Taipei, and will soon be overtaken by one big built in Dubai. 
the world's richest man in the world today is a Mexican. And its largest publicly traded corporation in the world today is Chinese. The world's biggest plane is built in Russia and the Ukraine. Its leading refinery is under construction in India, and its largest factories are all in China. By many measures, London again is becoming a very important place for financing. And in addition, we all know about uh, the United Arab Emirates who are generating great cash. Even in shopping, which was supposed to be the great American sport, it so happens that the largest in the world is in Beijing. And I could go on to say that a lot of the world is really acting dramatically. Now let me change to three of the many things that you are challenged with these days. First, Alexander Hamilton, clearly part of the nation's talented tenth, recognized that business, industry, development of a nation's infrastructure, and of lending, national financial institutions, would only make this a great nation. And it was important to create such. It's also said that uh, he and <coughs> President of Washington decided that in 25 years after the forming of the nation, there would be such military power that we could resist being invaded by foreign countries. These Hamilton decisions, in my judgment, helped our nation to leap forward to the 19th century. But at that point, industrialization swept the world. Unfortunately, for most people in other nations, their leadership judgment was simply to expand greatly their welfare state for its poorer groups rather than to open up the educational systems for all. Thus, the European nations had labor rules calling for shorter work week and work day and had much earlier retirement. It, it failed to extend education, public or private, to all of its people. Fortunately, the United States took an opposite approach. Early in the 19th century, it adopted the Mario Act, which remitted every state to set up educational institutions of higher learning using federal funds from the sale of federal land west of the Mississippi. Also, after the Second World War, those of us who fought in it got the advantage of the GI Bill of Rights and could go to college and law school by the government paying for it. And it's also true that some of our great cities, like Philadelphia, New York, and others, made great investment in education. Such permitted this nation to become the world's superpower. It also permitted our nation, when attacked in 1941 by Togo and Hitler, which each at the beginning had more people under arms and better equipped, to develop great fighting forces which preserve for you our liberty. Now, one of your challenges is that, unfortunately, much of such learning progress slowed 30 years ago. Former Governor Mitt Romney, for example, recently stated, I am convinced that, that unless America changes course, we will soon become the France or Italy of the 21st century still a great nation, but no longer its world leader. The loss of additional manufacturing jobs in the United States 
is often erroneously considered a worsome hollowing of our economy. But their absence ought not to be blamed on globalization. On the contrary, the shift of manufacturing jobs in steel, autos, and textiles, for example, to their more modern equipment in computers, telecommunications, and informa information technology is a plus, not a mi minus, to the American standard of living. The world consumers increasingly have been drawn to products embodying new ideas, new concepts. For example, the cell phone more than bicycles. Global trade gives us great access to all products throughout the world and at the cheapest price. The success of the United States has always been that it developed in those earlier seasons a great intelligent workforce. And believe it or not, Gettysburg is very impressive of that fact. Recall how learned, learned were the 39 men who signed the U.S. Declaration signed the U.S. Constitution on 17th September 1987. For today, often our children do not have the same type of teaching. Studies show, for example, that less than 5% of the teachers hired to teach mathematics in public schools have the ability to teach it. Study shows, for example, that less than 5% of the teachers uh, can really teach basic training. I don't think you can blame this on the fact that today, you parents, when you make love, end up creating children that are dumber than children who existed before. It's really that we just don't do it and we have to get it. Uh, Greenspan today is not the most popular guy, but I urge you to read chapter eight of his latest book. And he makes the point that the people that get trained and we say are the geniuses in technology and everything can work like hell and do what they do, but they can only produce a 3% growth in productivity. On the other hand, if the men and the women in the workforce also have talent, they can produce that other 3%. And I think most statisticians will tell you if we're going to continue to move ahead that that's what we have to do and train our children. In addition, we know that many companies that wish to hire people say that they can't write a good English sentence or they can't do the work. And once again, we can't be too irritated if law firms today are sending that type of work to India where you have people that can do it. I could go on, but I just urge you to think that one of your primary responsibility is to increase how we educate our children. And if we don't do it, we are really going to perhaps not be 50 years from now still the greatest nation. You also have to realize that today the world's completely different. Whatever you say or do today, within an hour, everybody in the world knows it. And today, uh, even though we usually speak in English, most people in the world understand English because you have CNN and you have the British broadcasting system. Now compare that with what happened when we defeated the British in the Revolutionary War in Virginia. It took them almost two months before they realized they'd been defeated. But that's, that's one reason why you really have to do it. <clears throat> now, there are many places of the world I could talk about, but I have picked 
to talk about the Middle East, which I think is a challenging place. As I understand it, there are 16 nations in that part of the world, including Iran. But you must hasten to realize that Iran is not Muslim, nor is it Arabian. Four of these nations, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iran, and Iraq, have tremendous oil deposits. You know the billions of dollars that we transferred to that part of the world last year. Now first, as I continue these remarks, I'd like to turn your interest to the letters S-A-L-A-F-I. <coughs> this term refers exclusively to the Sunni Muslims who have the basic belief that the only proper way to live one's life is by strict adherence to the laws <coughs> laid down in the Quran and the first people who uh, took control after Mohammed had died. Unfortunately, for this reason, the term is often translated into English as fundamentalist. The version of Islam propounded by the 18th century Arabic clerk, which became the form of Islam practiced throughout the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is one common form of such language. This version is often referred to by another name, a term which the uh, Saudis consider derogatory, preferring the name that I uh, uh, spelled to you. <coughs> and what you have to understand, it is a concept, and it doesn't necessarily mean terrorists. It means that people in that part of the world think that certain things are fundamental. Now, unfortunately, the terrorists have come in, they don't practice that, but what they do is to practice a completely different form, and clearly they've been successful so far because unfortunately, these great nations have a lot of money today, but they don't get it to the people at the bottom. And they have not kept their commitment to people in the middle who are the middle class people that go to college. Each one of those nations had a commitment that if you went to college, when you got finished, you got a job and got one paid, well paid, but today, they give you the job, they pay you well, but you don't have to do anything with the job. On the other hand, you have poor, and it's the radical Muslims that often get support by taking care of the poor. Uh, which means that they don't agree with the, what the terrorists say, but if you need your money for food and everything, you won't turn them in. And that's what we have to recognize. Now, there was a time when the Soviet Union felt that because it had a position vis-a-vis -vis the Israel ideas vis-a-vis -vis <coughs> the Israelis and the Palestinians, which was more in keeping with Muslims or some Muslims wanted, that they could control that part of the world. It hasn't happened that way because as the Soviet Union lost certain nations, it lost some of its power. Another challenge today is China, which is growing and is trying to help in that part of the war. But so far, I think we have the advantage. And if we realize that we have to understand those people, and in addition, help them not only to create the wealth, but help them to train their middle class and help them to give good jobs to the poor. If you ask many Saudis, they will tell you when they get a big job in Saudi Arabia and you need people to do the work, 
that those people in Saudi Arabia can't do it, they have to bring in people from other, other places. I think that there's a great challenge, a great opportunity, and I hope and I know from having dinner last night with some of your bright professors that he, the, in this group you're going to produce that talent at 10, which in each generation makes this country better than the last generation. Now the <coughs> next point I'd like to make is, and I hope I won't be laughed at, but I think that we have convinced the rest of the world that economic capitalism is probably the best way to go. And most nations, including even China and Russia, do that. And that's very important, and we have to remember that. And that's one of the great achievements that we've done. Now, we also feel that the only way even having a great capitalistic system, you also have to have a democracy. Now, believe it or not, there are some nations that disagree. In fact, uh, at one time they said, well, a democracy is nothing but the control of the mob. But even more important is, what do we really mean by democracy? I think we clearly mean certain fundamental things, but do we also mean that if your children begin to wear too fancy clothes, that necessarily, if you stop that, you're against democracy. I also think you have the difficulty, and I hope the ladies won't walk out, that if people have lived for generation after generation and can still have four wives and they live together, or if you have a place like Saudi Arabia that you can be <coughs> married to the richest man in the world, if you're a woman, you can't drive a car. Does that mean until we convince the Saudis that they have to let women drive a car that it has to be done? Now finally, the last thing I would like to say is please, please, when you deal with that part of the world, remember that at one time they had great civilizations and they often were ahead of Europe and certainly ahead of the United States. For example, I think that some of you would be shocked to realize that algebra and the concept of zero was developed in Algeria, a Muslim country. What year? 550 AD. And I point out to my friends at Harvard, there wasn't even any Harvard University at that time. <laughs> or what I point out to you at in Gettysburg, you have an institution, I don't think you'd won that battle, you didn't exist that time. And I'm really serious that you, you, you really got to, when you deal with people, you got to find out that they're really bright and able, and you have to know, and that's why I'm so encouraged about this institution. I came here, and I saw young people from different places talking to each other. They must be learning different language, because I assume the young lady from the Far East won't let you date her unless at least you can speak that much of her language. But anyway, you do it, and I just beg you, and I, in conclusion I say, this is a great nation. I think that uh, Thurgood Marshall, Bill Hasty, and Charlie Houston, and myself, fought to be admitted to it as a great nation. Now, please don't screw it up. Thank you. <laughs>